Bring in a moment. Okay. Great. So, dear friends, I'm so happy to see everyone today. My name is Daniela Osatsky Stern, and it is my pleasure to open this virtual event on contemporary views on perpetrator research. As scholars of the Holocaust, genocide, and World War II, we find ourselves again astonished watching the theater of the war in Ukraine, which brings back familiar sites of violence and destruction of civilian refugees and an incomprehensible leader. Tonight or today, depending on where you are, we are dealing with both World War II and the scholarship in Ukraine. And we will investigate new perspectives of research on the perpetrators. We are honored to have with us Professor Thomas Weber, whose presentation sheds new light on the number one perpetrator, Adolf Hitler, and his incipient anti-Semitism. I've heard one of Professor Weber's presentations not long ago and felt that it is so important for our program and for our students to invite him and present his fascinating research. And I thank him for accepting our invitation. The second distinguished scholar that we will hear today, and I am so happy and grateful that he is here with us, is Professor John Paul Himka, who will share with us insights on the research on perp perpetrators in Ukraine. We are very much looking forward to hearing both presentations. I believe I speak for all of us in the audience in sending our best wishes to our friends and colleagues in Ukraine for safety and fast return to normal life. And last but not least, it is my pleasure to thank yet again, Professor Edward Westerman, whom we consider a high authority in perpetrator studies. Professor Westerman will open our discussion with some important remarks. We thank him for his willingness to participate in our program. Some technical notes, we are recording this event and we'll upload it to our website. And please keep your microphones on mute. I want to introduce to you a new member from our team, Adi Cantor. Hi, Adi. Uh, Adi is a doctorate candidate at the University of Haifa. The title of her PhD is the place of the Holocaust and the crimes of the Third Reich in intergenerational narratives among the non-Jewish Germans, the grandchildren generation. Adi worked at the topography of terror and the Israeli embassy in Berlin and in the German Institute for International and Security Affairs. We also have with us today Jan Bujlaf, who is a William Aikman Fellow for Holocaust Studies at Harvard University and the former Fellow of Princeton University. He is currently completing his dissertation, The First Transnational History of Jewish Survival During the Holocaust. His latest articles on Belgets and the Holocaust in the Netherlands have appeared in Holocaust and Genocide Studies and Contemporary European History. I want to thank both of you so much for uh, being here. And of course, I want to thank Dr. Boaz Cohen, the head of the Holocaust Studies program at Western Galilee College, and Dr. Yaron Pasher from our team. 
I see so many good friends here. Uh, and Adi, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Daniela, for this kind introduction. It is really an honor for me to participate. This is my first uh, event as a team member. And it really is an honor uh, to be among you uh, with, uh, of course, all the dear friends and colleagues of the Western Galilee, and also, um, of course, the disting distinguished speakers, um, whom I believe will be uh, fascinating to hear tonight in Israel and in morning overseas. So, uh, hello again to all, all of you, friends and colleagues, and uh, really pleasure to have you with us in today's panel on contemporary views on perpetrator research. For the opening remarks, I'm pleased to introduce Professor Edward B. Westerman. Pro Edward B. Westerman received his uh, PhD from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and is a Regents Professor of History at Texas A&M University, San Antonio. He has published extensively in the areas of the Holocaust, genocide, and German military history. He's the author of four books and two co-edited volumes, including Hitler's Police Battalions, Enforcing Racial War in the East in 2005, and Hitler's Ostkrieg and the Indian Wars, Comparing Genocide and Conquest 2016. He was a Fulbright Fellow in Berlin, a three-time German Academic Exchange Service Day AAD Fellow, and a JNB and Morris e. Shapiro Fellow at the US HMM. His most recent work, Drunk on Genocide, Alcohol and Mass Murder in Nazi Germany appeared with Cornell University Press in association with the US HMM in March 2021. Please, Professor Westerman, the floor is yours. Thank you, Adi. Uh, thank you, Daniela, Yaron, uh, Jan, and uh, Boaz. I'm delighted to be able to offer some opening remarks that hopefully will frame uh, the historiography of uh, perpetrator studies and also of interpretations of anti-Semitism. And I'm delighted to share the floor uh, with Tomas Weber and also uh, with uh, John Paul Himke. Thank you. In Mein Kampf, Adolf Hitler proclaimed that the very, quote, the very first task of a really nationalist government was to seek and find forces determined to declare a war of annihilation against Marxism and to give these forces a free hand, end quote. When Hitler became chancellor in January 1933, his government made good on this promise in a campaign aimed at communists, socialists, and German Jews in the opening months of the Nazi regime. In fact, annihilation became the distinguishing hallmark of Nazism, whether in concentration camps and prisons within Germany, the killing centers of Poland, or in the bloodlands of Eastern Europe. Without doubt, the most prolific perpetrators came from among the ranks of the political soldiers of Heinrich Himmler's SS and police empire. Still, as the state of contemporary scholarship demonstrates, genocide was a societal endeavor that required the active and tacit uh, consent of millions, a process that involved soldiers, medical professionals, and bureaucratic functionaries, and a process that transcended gender lines and ultimately benefited millions of ordinary Germans who profited from the plundered wealth of Jewish neighbors and conquered peoples. The murderers and their accomplices were not only Germans, but also included a broad range of foreign nationals, such as Dutch and French policemen, Romanian soldiers, and SS and police aux auxiliaries taken from the subject populations of Eastern Europe, and on occasion, the Gentile neighbors of the Jews, as in the case of Yedvabne. While scholars have documented the activities of the murderers, the question of individual perpetration and the impulse for Nazi genocide has remained a central element of discourse. In the aftermath of World War II, newsreel footage of delirious and euphoric Germans cheering Hitler and images from the liberation of the concentration camps framed popular perceptions of Nazi fanaticism. In contrast, Hannah Arendt's description of Adolf Eichmann, one of the key organizers of the final solution, as a man characterized by, quote, a lack of imagination who, except for extraordinary diligence, 
in looking out for his personal advancement had no motives at all, end quote. Proved as influential as it was controversial in reshaping popular perceptions of the killers. Similarly, motivated by a desire to explain the actions of German killers, the psychologist Stanley Milgram conducted a series of experiments at Yale in 1962, after which he explicitly embraced Arendt's concept of the banality of evil as a model for explaining the actions of Nazi perpetrators. Quote, a case in which individuals chose obedience to authority over their personal, ethical, and moral beliefs. Two decades after Milgram's study, the academic community embarked upon a contentious debate centering on the extent and power and influence enjoyed by Hitler within the Nazi dictatorship. In short, was Hitler, quote, master of the Reich, or, quote, a weak dictator? This dispute reached beyond the persona of Hitler because it had profound implications for the interpretation of the Fuhrer's role in the final solution, as well as the role of the state apparatus in pursuing the means toward this end. The competing perspectives became embodied in the intentionalist and functionalist positions. The intentionalist argument in its strictest form contended that Hitler had embarked upon a premeditated path to genocide, a roadmap he laid out in Mein Kampf. In contrast, the functionalist interpretation insisted upon a twisted road to Auschwitz, a route sketched in large part by Hitler's paladins as they worked towards their Fuhrer on the path to genocide. While the intentionalist and functionalist dispute remained primarily a professor's debate, the central questions raised concerning agency and personal responsibility continue to remain a key focus of historical studies related to the perpetrator's motives for mass murder. Christopher Browning's influential Ordinary Men in 1992 catalyzed a renewed interest in the topic of perpetrator motivation. Based on the post-war criminal investigation of a group of Hamburg-based policemen, Browning examined the actions and motivations of a group of middle-aged police reservists in the mass murder of Polish Jews. He argued that it was deference to authority, career ambition, and peer group pressures that explained the transformation of ordinary Germans into killers. Browning's conclusions were challenged by the political scientist Daniel J. Goldhagen in 1996 with the publication of Hitler's Willing Executioners. Goldhagen rejected Browning's findings and offered an alternative explanation for the actions of ordinary Germans in genocide. He concluded that, quote, an eliminationist anti-Semitic German political culture provided the framework for both the Nazi leadership and ordinary Germans in the extermination of the Jews. The subsequent Goldhagen controversy added impetus to the question of how ordinary men could commit extraordinary evil. The soci social psychologist James Waller employed a comparative analysis of mass murder in the Holocaust, Cambodia, Guatemala, and the Balkans that balanced dispositional, situational, and social factors to explain the willingness of individuals to become instruments of mass atrocity. Similarly, Harald Welzer used a social psychological approach to identify a process of, quote, social restructuring, whereby the identification of Jews as the foreign other provided the justification for establishing the authority of the in-group Aryan Germans and initiated a process of incremental radicalization leading to annihilation. In contrast to social psychological analyses that largely minimized the role of ideology, Shaw Friedlander refocused the discussion on the importance of anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic tropes and the widespread acceptance of these ideas among Germans in the 1920s and 1930s as a key facilitator of genocide. For Friedlander, it was not a culture of eliminationist anti-Semitism that led to genocide, but rather a case in which Hitler and the hardcore of the Nazi party took advantage of existing anti-Semitic beliefs to create a quasi-religious theology of, quote, redemptive anti-Semitism, embracing apocalyptic and messianic elements with a, quote, vision of a redemptive final battle 
for the salvation of Aryan humanity. Similarly, Alon Confino identified a desire for a quote, world without Jews in which physical annihilation also included the eradication of Judaism as a theological and philosophical concept. The German historian Götz Ali offered another explanation for ordinary Germans' complicity in the exclusion, persecution, and eventual extermination of their, German, their Jewish neighbors. It was not anti-Semitism, an unshakable belief in Hitler, nor the fear of the regime's instruments of repression, but the Fuhrer's creation of a, quote, type of racist totalitarian welfare state which gained the acquiescence of the German population through the plunder of both the Jews and the conquered European peoples. In short, the German population sold their souls to an Austrian Mephistopheles for the apartments of their Jewish neighbors, French cognac and champagne and Belgian chocolates. Ali contends while anti-Semitism was a necessary precondition for the Nazi attack on European Jews, it was not a sufficient one. The material interests of millions of individuals first had to be brought together with anti-Semitic ideology before the Holocaust could take on its genocidal momentum. In contrast to examinations of German society as a whole, numerous studies have focused on the motives of specific organizations. With respect to the Wehrmacht, Omer Bartov led the way toward a fundamental re-examination of the actions and motivations of the German infantrymen on the Eastern Front. Bartov's pathbreaking study of the German army outlined the process by which ordinary men became, quote, highly professional and determined soldiers, brutalized instruments of a barbarous policy, and devoted believers in a murderous ideology, end quote. In his view, the transformation of the Lanze into an instrument of annihilation resulted from the demodernization of the war in the East caused by the destruction of primary groups, a perversion of discipline enforced through draconian punishments and the politicization of an army that came to embrace Nazi ideology. For her part, Isabel Hull identified the genesis of genocidal violence within the military culture of the German Imperial Army in Southwest Africa during colonial campaigns of annihilation aimed at the Herero and Nama. Hall concludes this military culture created a cult of violence and quote, bequeathed practices, habits of actions and ways of behaving that were easily harnessed for the ideological ends of even greater mass destruction and death. A case in which the military doctrines of the Kaiserreich, not Hitler's Reich, created the impetus for genocidal violence. In a similar vein, Bryce State's 2019 study on the German army found that ideological education in the 1930s proved a quote, important factor and key motivator for the Wehrmacht's involvement in atrocity. The percentage of Wehrmacht members who directly participated in atrocity and genocide may never be known, but the secretly recorded conversations of German prisoners of war revealed that quote, practically all German soldiers knew or suspected that Jews were being murdered in mass. According to Zonka Neitzel and Harald Velza, the examination of these prisoner transcripts reveals that the atrocities committed by the members of the German armed forces reflected a quote, general realignment from a civilian to a wartime frame of reference. In this view, it was not ideology, disposition, or a Nazified worldview that created mass murderers, but a new work environment that created and promoted new norms of desired and acceptable behavior, norms that encompassed and justified the conduct of atrocity. Another explanation for German military conduct focused on a conception of masculinity that exalt, exalted the ideal of soldierly camaraderie and promoted conformity. Comradeship in this view was the quote, cement of military group culture and a powerful bond between soldiers who risked the threat of social death and exclusion from their cohort for opposing or failing to participate in mass murder. In this view, ordinary soldiers became involved in extraordinary crimes, not due to fear of punishment or ideological indoctrination, 
but rather due to a higher duty of proving one's masculinity as a, quote, man among men, a bond strengthened by the shared experiences of danger and deprivation in the East. Studies focused on specific units and geographical areas offer additional explanations. In the case of the former, Waitman born emphasized the key role of command climate and leadership at the company level as the Wehrmacht became entangled in a racial war. Bjorn concluded, quote, the fact that institutional and unit cultures were decisive for the participation of German soldiers highlights for us the real impact of organizational structures and attitudes in influencing behavior. With regard to the role of place and time, Bastian Willem's recent study of the final stand of German forces in East Prussia in 1945 emphasized a process of radicalization and the barbarization of combat that, quote, lowered the heart rate of the Lanza in which comradeship and military necessity, not ideology, dictated atrocious acts. This small sample of the Wehrmacht underlines the difficulty of ascribing motivation to an, to an organization that included as many as 18 million men. If answers to what motivated the actions of German soldiers remains debated, evidence demonstrating the widespread direct participation of the German army in atrocity and genocide is undeniable, including the routine use of mass reprisal actions against civilians in Poland, Serbia, Greece, and the Soviet Union, the massacre of captured Black French colonial soldiers, and the responsibility for the deaths of over 3 million Soviet prisoners of war. Like the Wehrmacht, the primary role of Heinrich Himmler's SS and police forces in the conduct of genocide continues to draw the attention of historians. Although Hitler's immutable anti-Semitism and his role as the quote, most radical of the radicals within the Nazi party, established the trajectory for genocide, the Fuhrer still required faithful paladins and an army of political soldiers to achieve his vision of a utopian racial empire. In the case of the former, Reich leader of the SS Himmler emerged as the master architect of the final solution, a man who shared Hitler's ideological obsessions and became the pivotal figure in translating pre-war annihilatory rhetoric into reality. If Himmler was the master architect, then it was Reinhard Heydrich, chief of the security police, who was charged with transforming the blueprints of mass murder into the physical machinery for the destruction of the European Jews. According to Robert Gerwath, Hitler, Heydrich's, excuse me, Heydrich's pursuit of systematic mass murder emerged from a, quote, combination of wartime brutalization, frustration over failed expulsion schemes, pressures from local German administrators in the occupied East, and an ideology motivated a determination to solve the Jewish problem once and for all. Within the senior ranks of the SS, Mikhail Wiltz focused on the leadership of the Reich security main office and identified men of action guided by ambition and ideological commitment, who embraced a worldview that supported plans for exclusion, persecution, and ultimately annihilation of the racial enemies of the Third Reich. The perpetrators of genocide were not social misfits, but rather young, ambitious, well-educated men whose conversion to the ranks of National Socialism was facilitated by their existing nationalist inclinations and a vision of a new Germanic empire. In the case of the Holocaust by bullets, Hillary Earle describes the members of the Einsatzgruppen as neither natural born killers nor natural born anti-Semites, but rather men, quote, who believed in the principles of national socialism so much that they made its ideology the very basis of their behavior and who convinced themselves that the road to German rehabilitation was through racial, cultural, and ideological purity. For the mounted SS brigades operating under Himmler's command, these political soldiers engaged in a number of mass atrocities, especially against Jews. Indeed, when given orders to kill, the majority of these men fulfilled their murderous tasks based on a range of motivations. However, Martin Kuffers noted that, quote, the great importance of anti-Semitism as a fundamental personal motive of these SS men can be clearly established. The SS were not the only political soldiers operating in the East 
as the order police battalions emerged as a key element in genocide. In my research, I ascribed the participation of uniformed policemen to the critical influence of senior leaders, the creation of an organizational culture that glorified the ideals of a martial identity and a widespread acceptance of racial ideology within their ranks. In a more recent study, Ian Rich identified the major impulse for mass murder among the policemen as stemming from the ranks of a generational cohort of 20-something police officers whose own socialization under the regime made them the vanguard agents of annihilation. The killing fields in the East witnessed not only the murder of men, women, and children, but widespread acts of sexual violence as a routine part of Nazi occupation. Bagina Mulhäuser, one of the pioneers of research on sexual violence, established a linkage between the sexual crimes committed by German soldiers with the creation of a, quote, specific male martial morality within the Wehrmacht, in which the sexual abuse of conquered populations became not only a manifestation of, quote, sexual potency, but more importantly, of the, quote, invincibility of the German army as a whole. While Jewish and Slavic women fell victim to sexual predation, it is also clear that genocide was not only a man's work. Elisa Mylander examined the activities of female SS guards at Majdanek and their participation in acts of torture and murder as normally normalized, quote, workaday violence. For her part, Wendy Lauer's Hitler's Furies brought into focus the acts of hundreds of thousands of German women who traveled into the Nazi East as agents of colonial empire, including secretaries, nurses, party workers, Wehrmacht auxiliaries, and wives who proved to be, quote, zealous administrators, robbers, tormentors, and murderers in the bloodlands. In referencing female participation in mass murder, Lauer concludes, quote, Genocide is also women's business. When given the opportunity, too, women too will engage in it, even the bloodiest aspects of it. In conclusion, as this all too brief survey shows, scholars continue to search for the wellspring of the Nazi genocidal ethos that resulted in the murder of millions. And it is clear that their theories and conclusions on motivation will remain as diverse as the perpetrator groups themselves. While we may never know with certainty why ordinary and not so ordinary men and women chose to participate in mass murder, we do know that such a vast undertaking was only possible with the knowledge and support of Hitler. The man who had mentioned his quest to quote, find forces determined to declare a war of annihilation and quote in Mein Kampf certainly achieve his goal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Westerman, for this excellent, excellent introduction, which I really believe will, will serve as a very good base for our for the next discussion. And our next speaker is Professor Thomas Weber. Professor Thomas Weber is Professor of History and International and Director of the Center of Global Security and Governance at the University of Aberdeen, as well as a Senior Associate at the Center of European, Russian, and Euro-Asian Studies at the Monk uh, School of Global Affairs and Pu Public Policy at the University of Toronto. Holding a master's degree and a PhD from Oxford University, he has previously held positions at the University of Glasgow, the University of Chicago, the University of Pennsylvania, the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton and Harvard University. His books include Lodge Ghetto Album, Hitler's First War, and Becoming Hitler, The Making of a Nazi. Professor Weber will speak about Adolf Hitler's early eliminationist anti-Semitism. Please, Professor Weber. Thank you so much. Uh, just before I start, um, I've just realized with the three previous speakers, the sound here was a little bit broken up. So I don't know whether that's a problem at my hotel. So in case anyone um, has difficulties understanding me, please let me know, in which case I may have to just at some point turn off my camera. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yes, it's okay. okay. Very well. Um, then, then, then hopefully everything is all right. So thank you so much for uh, inviting me. Thank you, Daniela. Thank you, um, Adi. Thank you, Ed, for a wonderful 
um, first paper um, and uh, shalom to Israel or to wherever you are. So readers of uh, whoever might, for whatever reason, have ended up reading both the German and the English um, edition of Becoming Hitler, The Making of a Nazi, which I wrote a few years ago, might think that I have a split personality or that I kind of lost uh, my mind because they would, they would see that in the German version, which is actually an English translation of from English of an early version of an early draft of the um, English version, you would see a Hitler presented um, um, in a way out of a, still very much a kind of a functionalist mold, while um, in the um, English or American edition, you would uh, find a rather different Hitler. You would find a Hitler or you would find an author talking about a Hitler who's moving more and more towards a more intentionalist interpretation of Adolf Hitler and of the Holocaust. And here's my attempt to explain to you how this kind of move came about. I mean, in a way, it was just the, um, I mean, I started out many years ago as, as functionalist as they come, but I suppose as I was uh, writing my books and particularly in writing Becoming Hitler, I started to become across evidence where in a way, I realized in the early version of, um, of the book that I was trying to kind of force, um, force my interp interpretation onto the sources, my pre-existing interpretation onto the sources rather than the other way around. But so let's actually look at, um, at, at what I uh, found. So Hitler often uh, tends today to be reduced to the person who, through his extreme anti-Semitic uh, anti rhetoric, provided inspiration to German commanders in occupied wartime Europe to embark on the project of physically exterminating the Jews. We are frequently presented with the persona of a vengeful Hitler who, since the dying days of World War I, had obsessively hated the Jews. Yet, this was also Hitler who had never quite made up his mind as to what he really wanted to do with them, but who was happy to go along with genocide after others had initiated it. The problem with this view is that it privileges the written word, whether in the form of Hitler's early writings or of the official paper trail that the evolution and implementation of the final solution left behind over the spoken word. The belief that Hitler was not particularly central to the evolution of the final solution beyond providing inspiration to others is, is ultimately based on two things. First, an examination of Hitler's published words, as well as a dissection of German administrative processes in the lead up to the Holocaust. This belief has become so influential that new emerging evidence tends to be viewed through the lens of this new orthodoxy. This, I argue, is even the case when evidence clearly points in the opposite direction. For there are at least four pieces of evidence from the early 1920s, that is from the time just after his initial politicization and radicalization that revealed the existence of a preferred final solution on Hitler's part that in my mind, um, uh, Sorry, that, um, that in my mind was genocidal in character. Three of the four pieces of evidence come in the form of recollections of people with interactions with Hitler. And the fourth piece is a letter written to Rudolf Hess by a paternal friend of Hess, in which he responds to ideas reported to him by Hitler's aid. So the first piece of evidence is a state Hitler made as early as 1920. After meeting Hitler in the summer of 1920, a young law student wrote to a friend of his telling him that the Nazi leader had compared the Jews to bacillus that needed to be eradicated to save the body. Hitler had left no doubt that eradication for him was not simply a metaphor, arguing that faced with the choice between the being or non-being of a people, between sein or nicht sein eines Volkes, one cannot stop um, one can, to, to save life of the, um, 
of 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 a people that has um, has has uh, vicious intentions, um, or to uh, halt machen vor dem Leben des feindlich gesinnten gefährlichen fremden Stammes. Unlike in the case of the anti-Semites, for whom Hitler had taken inspiration and which I had detailed in Becoming Hitler, his own anti-Semitism might have uh, thus ceased to be metaphorical in character as early as 1920. So what, what I'm trying to say here is, is that the Hitler was of course taking inspiration from people like Chamberlain, uh, from people like Eckhart, and he was using very much the same language. He was using very much the same figures of speech. But I think there are good reasons to believe that while for Chamberlain or even Acker, they were ultimately figures of speech, that hit, unlike them, for Hitler, they soon ceased to be figures of speech. Uh, so Hitler's 1920 comment had been far from being a mere throwaway remark made in the heat of the moment. For instance, in 1922, he told an ex-officer and journalist in private that, I quote, once I really am in power, my first and foremost task will be the annihilation of the Jews, unquote, leaving no doubt as what annihilation would entail. And I quote again, as soon as I have the power to do so, I will have gallows built in rows at the Marienplatz in Munich, for example, as many as traffic allows. Then the Jews will be hanged indiscriminately and they will remain hanging until they stink. They will hang there as long as the principle of hygiene permit. As soon as they have been untied, the next batch will be strung up and so on down the line until the last Jew in Munich has been exterminated. Other cities will follow suit precisely in this fashion until all Germany has been completely cleansed of Jews." End of quote. Furthermore, on the ease of Hitler's failed putsch, Hitler gave an interview uh, to the Catalonian journalist Regeni Chama. According to Chama's account of the interview with Hitler in La Vue, La Vue de Catalunya, Hitler had already arrived on a final solution that was genocidal by 1923. In response to Hitler's statement that carrying out a pogrom in Munich was pointless, as afterward the Jews in the rest of the country would still continue to dominate politics and finance, Hama asked him, what do you want? Kill them all overnight? Hitler replied, that would of course be the best solution. And if one could pull it off, Germany would be saved. But that is not possible. I've looked into this problem from all sides. It is not possible. Instead of thanking us as they should, the world would attack us from all sides. Hitler added, hence, only expulsion is left, mass expulsion, unquote. Hitler's answer here is revealing and explaining the emergence of the Holocaust as he makes it perfectly clear that his preference by 1923 was for genocide, but that if an outright genocide was not possible, he would be pragmatic and go for the second best option, mass expulsion. Furthermore, the previous year, Ulrich Wille, a Swiss officer and paternal mentor to Hitler's aid Rudolf Hess, had written to Hess that, quote, believing you can exterminate Marxism and the Jews with machine guns is a fatal mistake, unquote. The letter and its context made it abundantly clear that by 1922, Hitler and Hess must have already floated the idea of using machine guns to exterminate the Jews. As the four pieces of evidence reveal, anti-Semitism was the one area in which Hitler was in private considerably more radical than in public. While in most other areas of policy, Hitler, Hitler fed off his audiences in the early 1920s, which drove a process of progressive radicalization, the process worked the other way around in Jewish affairs. Furthermore, Hitler was reluctant to put the Jewish endgame he had in mind on paper. So again, so with so much else, he was, he was kind of a big mouth at that time, but it came to, to anti-Semitism and to, to talking about the Jews, he, 
he strangely enough, even though of course he was extremely anti-Semitic in, in public, he was even, uh, even more so in, in private or semi-private settings. So when writing the first draft of Becoming Hitler, The Making of a Nazi, I was aware only of Willer's letter. In fact, in the German edition of the book, which is a, based, as I said earlier, on a translation of the first full draft of the book, I was still advancing an argument about Hitler's anti-Semitism that focuses on its metaphorical character. However, while researching and writing the first draft of my book, doubts about my own interpretation had started to brew. Subsequently, it was a result of a series of long conversations with other historians, and as well as stumbling across Samar's article, that I finally st started to change my mind on the nature of Hitler's anti-Semitism. In writing Becoming Hitler, I thus underwent a transformation from a died in the wool functionalist to what one may call a neo-intentionalist. I still believe that fixity and fluidity, along with functionalist intentionalist modes of behavior coexisted in Hitler, yet particularly against the background of the two other pieces of evidence I've presented to you that I see two as smoking guns, that genocide was on Hitler's mind as early as the 1920s, I now see the existence in Hitler's mind of a preferred final solution that was genocidal from as early as 19, uh, the, 19, the early 1920s. A preference without which we cannot understand what happened in the 1930s and 1940s, and one that makes the long path from post war Munich to Auschwitz less twisted than often believed. There has, of course, been a tendency to dismiss the idea of the existence of a rather more direct line running from Hitler's goals of the early 1920s to the Shoah. The argument tends to be to say, once in power, Hitler initially pursued non-genocidal policies aimed at driving Jews out of Germany. Hence, it does not make sense to draw a direct line between Hitler's intent from the early 1920s and the Holocaust but there's a flaw in that argument. Once in power, Hitler indeed initially encouraged Jewish immigration, yet his support for immigration has to be understood as the third best solution fueled by tactical pragmatism rather than as evidence that he had not yet envisioned uh, his preferred solution. In other words, as long as there was no prospect of systematic, systematically killing Jews, it was preferable to drive them out of the country rather than not to do anything. Yet, as Hitler believed that the supposedly pernicious influence of Jews and Jewish ideas was fatally weakening Germany's and Europe's ability to survive for all times, this was very much um, only a second or third best option. And the most radical solution of all, according to that logic, came with the highest chance that Germany and Europe would survive for all times. Furthermore, as a savvy political operator, Hitler also understood that at times he had to downplay his anti-Semitism. For instance, during the election campaigns of 1932, he barely mentioned Jews. Maybe let me just unpack a little bit what I've just said. I mean, about the so the point here is, is that when Hitler is politicized and radicalized in the aftermath of the First World War, Hitler, Hitler thinks that it will really be an uphill struggle for Germany to come back from the brink and to, as he believed that the world is undergoing a transformation to an age of, say, superpowers, that um, Germany, um, that, that would make the cut to be one of those because he thought that Germany was really held back um, by, again, domestically by the pernicious influence of the Jews and externally by insufficient territory, insufficient manpower and insufficient resources. In, so Hitler did not think that Germany was particularly strong or even that the Germans were particularly strong, but he thought it was better to try than, than to, to just die without trying. But what follows from this is that the logic uh, of this is that Hitler will always go for the most radical solution that is possible 
to address these problems. Hence, he was perfectly willing to accept, for instance, immigration for a while, but that does not mean that he did have a had that he had at the back of his mind that it would be preferable to exterminate the Jews because it would be a more perfect solution, if you will, to address the initial problem. And the developmental logic, therefore, would be once and if um, genocide would become possible, that he would go for it. So nevertheless, once he pursued his two long-term primary political goals in tandem, the creation of a sufficiently large Germany through the grabbing of new territory in the East and the removal of Jews from the state he was attempting to create, um, one thing was clear. It became suddenly possible to pursue his preferred final solution. At any rate, Hitler no longer had any plausible alternative to either outright genocide or ethnic cleansing with genocidal consequences. Expulsion was not a practical solution in wartime. There simply was no country to which uh, Jews could have been sent. And unlike in the Armenian case in the First World War, due to the realities of Germany war, Germany's war fortunes in the 1940s, Jews could not be dislo dislocated from their core areas of settlement to some other area under German rule. It may well be true that in a technical sense, the physical extermination of Jews in Poland began with decisions made on the ground without clear orders coming from Berlin. However, they were only made because Hitler embarked on a war aimed at the simultaneous grabbing of territory and removal of Jews in a context in which he, his preferred solution arguably had always been genocidal, as had been the developmental logic of his actions and intentions. In short, decision makers on the ground found themselves in a situation of Hitler's making. Technically, they had no decisions to make. One th the systematic killing of Jews in Poland got underway. There was, however, no real alternative left for decision makers on the ground to making genocidal choices due to the, due to the decisions Hitler had taken earlier on. In other words, Hitler's early decisions had set his administrators in Poland on a path on which the only plausible solutions to the problems they had to face were genocidal. And he believed that initiatives resulting in the Holocaust genuinely had come from below is thus arguably an illusion. Hitler himself laid the heart of the emergence of the Holocaust, as well as the progressive radicalization of the policies of the Third Reich. Even though, of course, I mean, Ed Westerman is absolutely right. Um, he could have not pulled it off without the consent and the participation of tens of millions of Germans. So orders coming directly from Hitler had started the war and directly resulted in subsequent orders by Hitler that mandated rounding up the Jews of Poland as well as mowing down by machine guns, the Jews of the Soviet Union. Thus the idea that the Holocaust only started in the second half of 1941, that is when hundreds of thousands of Jews had already been killed in the Soviet Union during Operation Barbarossa does not add up. The murder emanated from Hitler's desire to create a German empire, not only with his sufficient territory, but one that had been cleared of Jews in a way that he had already envisaged as early as 1922 and 1923, as evident in the pieces of evidence I've presented here today. It is not only Hitler's early intent about a preferred final solution that matters, equally and even more importantly was important was, as hinted earlier, the developmental genocidal logic of Hitler's goals and style of politics, irrespective of what Hitler in the 1920s and 1930s had considered as being possible to pull off in the future. Whether or not you agree with my neo-intentionalist reading of the evidence presented today, at the very least, I do hope that we can agree on the need to take a fresh look at several pieces of evidence We'll have to look for further evidence from the early 1920s. Second, evidence that will shed light on Hitler's modes of behavior in the 1930s and early 1940s. And finally, all the oral and written evidence that is available and, and might become available on oral orders given by Hitler between 1940 and 1942. 
In other words, we need to look at sources that have either not surfaced yet or have at least not been available, even though we know of their existence, or that have been hiding in plain sight. With that, I mean sources that have been dismissed as insignificant as a result of a teleological search for evidence in support of a functionalist interpretations of the Holocaust. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Weber, for this fascinating argument. Uh, and thanks, Adi. Uh, great to see everybody. Uh, I will now introduce John Paul Himka, who is a professor of history emeritus at the University of Alberta. Professor Himka received his PhD in history from the University of Michigan and is the author most recently of the excellent book, Ukrainian Nationalism and the Holocaust, OUN and UPA's participation in the destruction of Ukrainian Jewry, 1941-44, published uh, last year. He has published extensively on various aspects of Ukrainian history, including the Holocaust in Ukraine and its reception in post-communist Europe. Not only for this reason is he such a precious voice of this complicated past that has surfaced so brutally and has been so distorted as well in the, in the past few weeks. I recommend to anybody the short piece that Professor Himmel wrote on the new fascism uh, syllabus on several colleagues in Ukraine, including the friend of, of this program, uh, Yuri. On a more personal note, I'm thrilled to have you, John Paul, as a mentor of mine, as is the team and the audience. Thanks for making time for us. And as the saying goes, the Zoom floor is yours. Thanks very much. <clears throat> so I, uh, <clears throat> I have a cold or a flu, so I, I might sound a little raspy. Um, now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a tour of who's working on perpetrators in Ukraine, although some of these people have been displaced. So for that, because I'm going to be mentioning a lot of Ukrainian names, and I think most, most people know the German names, <laughs> Uh, of uh, Holocaust perpetrators um, and researchers. Uh, I'm going to use a PowerPoint simply because it, otherwise it'd be very hard, to, I think, to follow um, my talk. So <clears throat> I'll start here. Uh, there is in Ukraine a division in hol a Holocaust studies, a very odd one, really, um, which is that in, 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 in Jewish scholars of the Holocaust have been pretty reluctant to discuss local collaborators and local perpetrators. And particularly, they have been reluctant to discuss the organization of Ukrainian nationalists and the Ukrainian insurgent army, known as UPA, as, as perpetrators. I, I'm just mentioning this I don't understand it, but uh, it does exist. So Anatoly Podolsky is the head of the Ukrainian Center for Holocaust Studies in Kyiv, uh, a, a, a very good uh, activist on, on, uh, on the Holocaust and, and uh, uh, having courses for teachers and uh, doing a lot of work publishing an excellent journal called Holocaust Suchasnist, which is the Holocaust and Contemporaneity. Uh, but he doesn't really want to deal with these issues uh, uh, of uh, local perpetration. Neither does Vitaly Nachmanovich, who's an expert on Babi Yar. And they're both probably connected with uh, Yosef Zisels and his Association of Jewish Organizations and Communities of Ukraine, which is only one of, of the kind of uh, 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 Jewish organizations in Ukraine. And... Um, and, and these um, uh, Jewish scholars have also um, um, objected to the Babi Yar Memorial Complex in Kiev, uh, at least one of the versions of that. And I, I, like I say, I'm mentioning this, but it's not something I really understand. And so I will go to, um, I will go to the individuals uh, Let's see, how do I move this forward? So I, I see that you, you know Yuri Radchenko. Uh, he's a big guy, uh, tall. Uh, he lived in our house for a while. My family named him the Yeti. That is the Sasquatch because of his great size. 
He's based in Kharkiv, although I think he's been displaced. And he has a good uh, 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 base there to work at the, as the head of the Center for Ethnic Eth Interethnic Relations Research in Eastern Europe at Vien Karazin Kharkiv National University. And he works closely also with Artem Karchen, uh, Karchenko. And he publishes in the premier journals of Holocaust studies worldwide, uh, Holocaust and Genocide Studies, Yad Vashem Studies, uh, and in Ukraine, uh, Holocaust and Suchasnys, the journal I mentioned. He integrates German, Israeli, and North American scholarship into his perspectives. This is something which only a minority of Ukrainian scholars on any theme do. And he has written very important studies of the civil administration and police in Kharkiv and the participation in the Holocaust of the Melnik wing of the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists. Mostly people, uh, mostly scholars have focused on the Bandera wing of the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists and he uh, expanded to the Melnik wing, wing. He's a polyglot. He knows, I don't know how many languages, but quite a few. Um, he started out as Ukrainian, but he converted to uh, Judaism uh, a couple of years ago. And now he's on a new project to study the Karaites, less to do with, with perpetrators and more to do with uh, a very interesting kind of example of, uh, of the Holocaust that's understudied. Local Karaites in Ukraine. Another very important scholar is Marta Havreshko. Uh, she's based in Lviv, but is currently in Hamburg. As I said to her on, a, on a Zoom a couple of days ago, she's a hamburger now. Uh, she did her studies at the Ivan Franco Lviv National University and got her candidate's degree, which is kind of equivalent of our PhD in 2010. Uh, and she's worked in the Ukrainian Catholic University in Lviv, but you know that's not always a happy story. It's supposedly a fairly liberal university, but she was forbidden to teach courses with gender in the title, uh, and, and and she's very deeply into uh, uh, gender studies. Her main base is the Ivan Kripikevich Institute of Ukrainian Studies of the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine. Uh, there, she's fa faced quite a bit of discrimination at the workplace for her work on the Holocaust and on her work on the Ukrainian nationalists. She's a master of oral history. Uh, because she deals mainly with women's issues, she has become a super expert on talking to old women. Uh, old women, um, creating common ground, common space over various women's issues, always brings them little gifts, you know, tea or oranges or something like that, gets them talking and has an incredible uh, collection of testimonies, uh, memoirs uh, of, uh, of various, uh, of nationalists, of, uh, of Jewish women uh, who, who were persecuted, uh, she just has an incredible uh, source base. And she works on sexuality and sexual violence during the Holocaust and women's role as victims and perpetrators and rescuers. So she, she does, does quite a bit on, on uh, various uh, women's issues. This is one of her most, one of her recent publications. It's in Ukrainian from that journal Holocaust Isuchasnis from 2019. And the title is uh, The Rape, Rape in Hiding Places, Sexual Violence During the Holocaust in Ukraine. So very, uh, and, and it's quite a detailed study based on uh, those uh, sources which she's collected over the years. Another guy, uh, not well known in the West, uh, his English is probably not as good as the others, too. Uh, studied at Ostroch Academy, based primarily now in Lviv at various institutions, uh, in particular at the Memorial Museum Territory of Terror, which deals with 
the uh, both the Soviet period and the Nazi occupation. He has a major online exhibit he did with the Center for Urban History in Lviv on the Lviv pogrom. And he put together an online guide to Holocaust places in Lviv. So I'm just going to get out of this for a minute and go to some of the things he's, uh, he's been working on. So here's this um, interactive uh, uh, study with numerous pictures on the Holocaust, on the, on the pogrom of Lviv, which occurred in 1st of July, 1941, one of the, one of the first major uh, moments in the, in the Holocaust. And um, and I'm trying to get up here. And he also did this one. Uh, this is a online a guide to the Holocaust in Lviv. Uh, it's got a mobile phone version and also an English version. City of Unmemory, virtual tour along the Holocaust sites in Lviv. It's a very important uh, work he does with the Center for Urban History in, um, in Lviv. Okay, I'm gonna go back to my PowerPoint. So, uh, uh, oh, and Andri, one of the hallmarks of his work is that he does a lot of work with local records. Uh, so uh, he gets uh, the trials of policemen, the trials of various perpetrators, and one of his goals is to try to get into the mindset of these uh, people. So, uh, slide show. The next scholar is Mikhail Otyakli, a burly guy, uh, a chain smoker in Kiev at the Ukrainian Center for Holocaust Studies. He got involved in Holocaust studies because of that project Spielberg had of, uh, of um, videotaping the um, uh, memoirs of, of uh, Holocaust survivors and uh, other people, uh, 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 including rescuers and others which became the basis of the USC Shoah um, project. Anyways, uh, he, as a young man, was hired to type out the transcripts of these interviews. And he became so moved by what he was learning about the Holocaust history that he devoted the rest of his life uh, to Holocaust studies. And his first important works were on Crimea, the Holocaust in Crimea, and uh, including uh, works on anti-Semitic propaganda in Crimea. And now he is uh, studying the Roma people and the Sinti people in Ukraine. Um, and one hallmark of his work is that he doesn't, re he doesn't um, hold back from uh, blaming and uh, explaining uh, local uh, perpetrators of the Holocaust. Another fellow is Roman uh, Shrachtet, based in Kriviri in central Ukraine. Uh, and he too works on the basis of local records and has written on the police and on the civil administration which, by the way, the civil administration is really remarkably uh, understudied in Ukraine. Uh, but he's been writing on it, uh, as I say, on the basis of local records. And when you put some of his work together with other people's work, you get a good picture of uh, what, what was going on in those, those parts of uh, Nazi-occupied Ukraine. Then, uh, And then, um, I don't know these people personally, Oleg Klemenko and Serhit Katsov, but they wrote uh, two, two major studies of police, very, very detailed 
excellent studies of uh, the auxiliary uh, police. So uh, these two monographs that they wrote, uh, each is about 300 pages long. There will be lists of all the policemen, uh, lists of all the uh, organization of Ukrainian nationalist militia, um, little biograms for everybody, uh, lots about motivations, lots about activities, really a, a, a very, a very interesting study. And they are based, their studies are based on local archives of Kremenets and, and Ternopil. Um, uh, after World War II, uh, the Soviets took, uh, re, 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 redrew, redrew the borders a bit so that uh, this, this town of Kremenets, which had been in the Reichskommissariat Ukraine, was uh, um, next to Ternopil Oblast or Ternopil District. So that in the local archives in Ternopil, and in Kremenets, there are um, there are records from both District Galician, where the uh, Ukrainian Auxiliary Police function, and from uh, the Reichskommissariat, the uh, uh, stationary Schutzmannschaften that were involved in uh, uh, Holocaust there. Um, and Klemenko is a candidate of historical sciences to Kutchoff as a teacher. But together they, they did a really a remarkable job. Here are the covers of, uh, of their two volumes. And uh, like I say, indispensable. Um, Mikhailo Martinenko is um, of a kind of nationalist persuasion, but he wrote about the Ukrainian auxiliary police in Lviv which uh, also provides pretty good information. So these, these, are the, these are the kind of people that are there. They're often, uh, they're often have an uphill fight uh, in Ukraine because of, um, well, an embarrassment over what happened during the Holocaust. So it's very important for these scholars to get fellowships at places like the United States uh, a Holocaust Memorial Museum or at Yad Vashem or at other institutions in Israel or Germany or, or North America. They need that. They need that kind of support, that moral support that comes from, uh, uh, from meeting other Holocaust scholars at these um, uh, prestigious institutions. Also, it really helps them with their languages. Uh, you can't do Holocaust studies without uh, English these days. You need German. Uh, when they do the traveling, they learn these languages. So very important to encourage uh, these scholars. And also, I would say, very important to recognize their work, to uh, cite them. Now, they mainly write in Ukrainian, but not entirely. Uh, a lot of them also write in English. So I, uh, I'm going to stop the share. Uh, I'm going to stop the share and say that, uh, again, we have to make an effort to include uh, these kind of scholars and their work. Uh, uh, very often, we kind of parachute into Eastern Europe, you know, without knowing the, who are the scholars, what are the languages you need to know? Uh, German is not sufficient for understanding what happens in Eastern Europe. You have to know other languages and you have to really learn from these people. All these people I mentioned are people who started writing in the 2010s. All the people I mentioned, except for Klemenko and Tkachov, are young people. They're, you know, I would say the average age here is 30, 35, something like that. Uh, and they just need our support. They work in very difficult situations. And they have a lot of information about why people join into these kind of uh, perpetrator organizations, you know, what's motivating them. And um, I, I just want to repeat how important it is to become familiar with their work.
Okay, thank you. Just to say that uh, Yuri is here with us. Yuri, if I don't know if you can open your camera. Is Yuri I'll there? Try. Hello. Hello, <laughs> <laughs> oh, Yuri. Good evening. Well, maybe Yuri can add something to this. Unfortunately, I didn't have happiness to hear everything what you talked about, <laughs> all these yeah. scholars, but I'm sure uh, you know a lot uh, because you met all these people and you know some of them personally, some you know. Thank you. Thank you, you're, you're, you're more than welcome, of course, to participate also in the discussion that we're just now opening. So I'd like to thank all our speakers uh, today. It was fascinating to listen to all of you. Thank you very, very much. And I'm very happy to open uh, the stage now for Q and A's. Um, before we uh, collect some questions from the audience, I, I wrote here two, two questions of my own that I, I'm really um, quite fascinated to hear your opinions about. The first one is to Professor Weber and the, and the second one is to Professor Himka. So Professor Weber, um, thank you again, first of all, for your presentation. Uh, it was really interesting to listen. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering um, how much was Hitler's anti-Semitism present before World War I? I'm asking this because I know in previous lectures of yours, you mentioned the fact that he was referring not only to Jews, but more, more uh, to finance capitalism, for example, I mean, and this, and you mentioned also, I remember listening to prior lectures of yours, and, and you said that it is very important to understand warning signs also when um, ideologues or, or, or extremists are not necessarily um, using the word Jews or in a very extreme radical way, but use other codes like finance capitalism like Hitler used to do in his early years and I and I know that you this was a very important point that you mentioned in, in a prior lectures of lecture of yours so I'd like to hear maybe you can elaborate a bit more on that because it may be connected to today to see the warning signs today of radicals and not only to look for uh, uh, you know, uh, to look for them in the most radical groups, uh, right wing, uh, extreme right wing, but maybe find them also in the center of society uh, from both right and left. So I'd like to hear your opinion about this. This is question number one. And question number two goes to Professor Himka, if I may. Um, thank you again and uh, for, for telling us about the scholarly work of, of Ukrainians about, about this subject. I'm, I'm wondering how much have they um, referred in their studies to the aftermath of 1940, uh, 1945, what happened with Ukrainian paper perpetrators after the war, some of them immigrated to the US, uh, and a little bit what happened with them after the war. And this again, I'm, I'm, some, I'm connecting it to our days today and today's Ukraine and the glorification of its heroes and how much do they refer to what has happened in the Ukraine in recent, um, in recent years? Thank you very much again. Professor Weber, <laughs> you were muted. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, these are two perfect questions. My, 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 it, 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 to the audience, it must almost look as if I placed them with you. So I can assure you, I didn't know of the questions. They're perfect because the first question allows me to, uh, to say something that I wanted to say at the end of my paper, but then realized that my 20 minutes were up. The second one allowed me to make a pitch for a talk I'll give in Jerusalem in early June. So about the first, first part of the question about pre-war pre anti-Semitism, I mean, I guess, what I also realized in recent years was that my insistence on that Hitler really was an anti-Semitic prior until after the First World War was maybe doesn't quite add up. I mean, I think um, I still I still do think that there is a massive change or mutation in his anti-Semitism occurring after the First World War, but I'm no longer so sure about this idea that prior to that he wasn't anti-Semitic at all. Uh, I mean, uh, obviously I never sat 
he was an anti-Semitic at all. I mean, in a world of anti-Semites, it would have been it would have been strange if he was the one uh, the the one odd person out. But the um, part of the reason why I've started to revisit the question of what was happening before the First World War was because I came across, as some of you, if you've seen my article on the Journal of Holocaust Research, might be aware of, so I came across an interview, the daughter of the person with, of the family whom Hitler lodged um, before the First World War gave an interview at the end of her life. And of course, it's a problematic source, but it still uh, strongly suggests that Hitler already made in private comments about that it had been down to the influence of the Jews in Austria and in Vienna, why he had left um, Austria and that he didn't want to serve in um, in the Austrian um, Hungarian armed forces because of the Jewish um, influence and there are also some um, suggestion that he made comments about um, Jewish bus business practices in pre-war Munich. I still would say that this was at least at that point not important enough for him to kind of talk about it in public, for instance, during the First World War when he was well, of course not public, but kind of to, to, to others, he was still able to have interactions with other Jews. It was not the kind of one thing that held everything together um, it, um, in his worldview but it was something that seemed to have been emerging. And that also in a way points us in a minute to kinds of things that maybe ha are happening under the surface and that might have their own developmental logic of their own that people might not even be aware of. So in other words, I do think if we need to understand Hitler's uh, turn to this kind of radical proto-eliminationist and anti-Semitism after the First World War, we also need to understand his views early on. Yes, it was a mutation, but the mutation came came somewhere from, and so arguably, without these pre-war views, the that post-war um, is post-war mutation couldn't have occurred, and this also leads in in a way both to the issue about today as well as to Hitler at that time, because you could say even before he was aware of or he had conceptualized his ideas as being violently anti-Semitic he was developing ideas that would make him uh, receptive um, to anti-Semitic explanations or to blaming the Jews for all the ills um, of the world. I mean, you, you mentioned there this kind of certain kind of anti-capitalism. Um, and so I think in that sense, it, it, I think it's, it certainly would make sense to talk about a developmental logic from these kind of early views of Hitler to um, to, to anti-Semitism. And in a way that, that leaves me, sorry, I've given far too long answer, but that, that leads me to, um, to, to, to uh, talking about today and making a short pitch for um, a talk I'm giving, going to give at the, at the workshop on defining uh, anti-Semitism today, which is basically the kind of anti-Semitism that is not anti-Semitic and anti-Semitic at the same time, where we, where people might not um, think it, they may not themselves think that they're anti-Semitic or the, what, 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 what they say is anti-Semitic, but they use language that is precise, they uses um, anti-Semitic ideas or is, is, um, stands in the tradition of anti-Semitic uh, conspiracy theories. And um, I would see those probably precisely because of the developmental logic both at the time and where uh, both in early 20th century and where that led us to, as well as for its potential today, I would see this as a kind of the canaries in the coal mine. So in many ways, I think today we're far too hung up on figuring out when we want to get the perfect definition of anti-Semitism, whether it's Jerusalem or HR or whatever else, to basically say, so is it anti-Semitism or is it not anti-Semitism? That kind of misses the point. I mean, that's ultimately a question of labels. The question is what 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 what's it behind the label and what the trajectory of that of those kinds of ideas are. Exactly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Himka. Okay, so um, scholars in Ukraine have not dealt with the immediate aftermath of the Holocaust. It's a very important topic. Uh, you know, the works like Jan Gross's works, the trilogy he wrote, you know, Neighbors, Golden Harvest, On the Celts of Fear, On the Celts of Pogrom, that kind of work 
hasn't been done in Ukraine. Uh, although there is some work being done by Western scholars on those, on those topics. Um, and I, I think if Jeffrey Birds has written some things on this, there are, there are things that, that are, are being done there. In Ukraine, people are working with local archives and, uh, and, they're, and they're concentrating on the, on, on the Second World War, uh, not on that immediate aftermath. Also, Poland was a different society than the Soviet Union, and that creates kind of a, a, a different set of tales. But you were also asking about the, the Ukrainian diaspora after World War II, as I understood it. So, you know, the Ukrainian immigration to North America began in the late 19th century. People came over to work in the mines. People came over to build homesteads in Canada. Uh, some people came between the war, but a lot of people came after World War II. And to a great extent, uh, those were people who one way or another were involved uh, with the Nazi occupation. So, you know, that could be in the propaganda, uh, writing for... Uh, legal newspapers under the Nazis that could be in the civil administration, uh, you know, uh, uh, that could be uh, members of OUN and UPA, that could be the Waffen SS Galician. You know, there are numerous um, people who came over who one way or another, as I say, was involved with uh, occupation. And as a result have been less than forthcoming about the history, and in fact, uh, quite upset when people talk about the Holocaust history in Ukraine. Uh, there are very there are no real studies of this. I've I've written an essay or two, but it, it's you know there's been no 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 real study on, on that subject. Now there was a question in the chat I saw, and maybe I I'll, I'll just take the take the opportunity to to to, to go on it. They asked about the decommunization laws of 2015, which enshrined uh, UN and UPA as uh, national heroes and that they couldn't be criticized. However, uh, scholarly works were exempt from that law. You can, you can, uh, uh, you, you can, you can write a, a, an honest history. And people have, uh, have continued to write after the decommunization laws, although, uh, that has made it more difficult to find acceptance for their work. That would have been my question. So I turn back the floor to Adi. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, Professor Himka. I, I see here uh, in the chat, we have a question, uh, question written by Daniel Bitran to Professor Weber. Uh, Professor Weber's thesis argument leads one to conclude that without Hitler, the Holocaust would not have taken place. But what of the other ideologues? Would Himmler not have been a suitable replacement with similar murderous intentions? You're muted, Professor Weber. <laughs> Sorry, uh, that's a great question, but I think in a way it depends on the 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 point in time you look at. I mean, the so let's assume Hitler was would have been assassinated um, in the mid 1930s. Sure, obviously we can think of um, of of very of a number of other people taking over with genocidal ideas. Um, there's there's a very there, there's of course there is a very I mean in a way there's of course an evaluation of the very point in Gabriel Rosenfeld's What Ifs in Jewish History where he looks at the likely scenario if the um, attempt on Hitler's life um, had succeeded in 1939 and he comes up with a scenario of still Holocaust happening but one with about um, half the number of victims, which of course doesn't make it a better genocide. But the point here is that um, I think the closer you get to the final solution or the close, or once Hitler is in power, obviously if Hitler had been, uh, Hitler could easily have been replaced by people close to him who would have also gone for some kind of genocidal policy, maybe not Goering, but certainly someone like Himmler. But, 
if you now go back in time and you assume that Hitler would have been um, is, would have been killed at say 1923 in in the failed coup, then even people from his own party like like Himmler I Heydrich would in, would not necessarily have developed the way they did. I mean, if you look at the early life of Heydrich or Himmler, there was th there was little that really pointed towards that kind of anti-Semitism in their lives. Or if Hitler had been killed in the First World War, there would have if everything still would have been equal, there would have still been um, the um, a void to fill. Um, and it's, of course, also important to remember that in Europe, east of the Rhine and south of the Alps, with the exception of Czechoslovakia, liberal democracy fell everywhere. So there certainly would in all likelihood have been a radical right-wing Germany that would have made life for Jews unpleasant. But whether and make life for Jews unpleasant would mean genocidal solution, I'm not so sure. I wouldn't say it was either Hitler or or everything would have been fine. So I can certainly think of, um, of other people who could have filled the void who, where you would have also ended up with some kind of genocide. Also, let's bear in mind, genocide starts initially in Romania during the Second World War. So it's not it's certainly not all Hitler. But at the same time, I think more likely than not, the void would have been filled by a different person on the radical right who would have had compatible ideas with Hitler, she would have been very anti-Semitic, but who would have unlikely to have pushed for that kind of um, genocidal solution. Um, of course, we have, as um, Ed Westerman said, in, uh, very elaborately explained, if you, I mean, there are all these explanations of why people go along with um, genocide, why they might also be predisposed to genocide, um, but there needs to be something at the leadership generally to turn, um, say, genocidal pogroms into a um, into a systematic and concerted program of genocide, and that brings us to leadership. Right. Thank you very much, Professor Weber. Professor Westermann, maybe you'd like to add a few remarks from your own. <laughs> Well, I, yeah, for the uh, for the uh, last uh, conversation, yeah, I definitely think uh, we, I think we can back up uh, the idea that that Hitler, as a in terms of an evil political genius, as somebody that does have a political genius for working through uh, the German polity, and if he dies in the in the so-called March on Munich, you know, that uh, I think that that really would widen the scope to who's going to take his place. And in fact, is the Nazi party going to have the success that they would have under the charismatic type leadership that, that Hitler is able to bring? You know, the party itself, if we think about Straza and the left wing, there's, there's other opportunities there that I agree with. The party still may have been a major, uh, a major at least transitory phenomenon, uh, just like fascism. Uh, in Europe and populism in Europe in the time period uh, in other countries was. But with respect to, I think, if we look at uh, the architects, in this case, Himmler, if we look at what the SS and police empire, uh, uh, you know, achieves, I think that's largely in consonance with very much a close collaboration with this vision that Hitler provides to his paladins, right? And so I think that that vision would have been, uh, would have been different. I don't know if it would have been genocidal, uh, it would have certainly been exclusionary uh, for Jews, but I, I don't think, uh, I, I wouldn't go as far to think it's genocidal. In terms of the discussion, for me personally, I think uh, no Hitler, no Holocaust. That's just my personal opinion. Uh, it, that's just the way I see it. Thank you, Professor Westerman. I see here another another question from the audience by Gabriel Finder, uh, one for Professor Weber and Sorry, the other one Adi, Professor Adi, yes. but before I think that Yuri raised his hand, you want to say something before we will go to the next question? If I may ask, uh, uh, you mentioned about uh, Otto Strasser and no, I read his memories of the war memories and um, he didn't mention anything about anything bad about Jews. 
If you have any information, what did he write before his emigration to Czechoslovakia? Anything? What his close point of view to Jews and to Jewish problem, let's say, in, in Germany, like left wing? Because we have also uh, interesting left wing in a Bandera party. Uh, it was mentioned about this stuff, I think, uh, during the lecture. And what was uh, <laughs> point of view of left wing of National Socialists in Germany? If you have such information, of course. Uh, Yuri, I, I, I would uh, I would defer to Tomas in this case. Uh, but what I would say about that is, if we think about uh, Otto and Gregor Strasse, that uh, the party we tend to we tend to uh, unify the Nazi party as kind of a uh, as kind of a monolithic whole, and I think that that often leads to an under evaluation. Uh, of the schisms that that party itself, uh, itself early on at least, uh, had. And we can look at that in uh, looking at, um, uh, for example, Gauleiters uh, in uh, the 1920s in Hamburg, for example, or, uh, uh, or SA leaders who have very different perceptions uh, of it. We see it with the Rumputsch, right? Uh, this idea of uh, where is the party going if the second revolution takes place? Certainly anti-Semitic, but maybe more in workers, uh, social uh, social programs, even educational programs, exclusion of Jews, the idea of the party program being Jews as foreigners in Germany. But uh, uh, you know, again, I think Thomas, you're probably better uh, uh, better situated to discuss that. But I do think that your question, uh, there is contingency in the development of the Nazi Party, and sometimes I think we tend to straight line that uh, that uh, that progression of the party. All right, then we have a question or a comment uh, from uh, Professor Goda for Ed as well, uh, who, who mentions the, uh, the, the work on Nazi torturers, uh, the growing literature on torture in Argentina, uh, Cambodia, USSR, uh, which draws very heavily on the Holocaust perpetrators uh, debates. And he wonders why there is not more cross fertilization of, of these debates. And he asked, why do we not draw more from this sort of work? Is it perhaps a justifiable concern about universal, universalizing the Holocaust? Or is it because there's so much Nazi material to draw on that we simply do not look as far as a field as we might? Yeah, I think uh, uh, Norm's question really raises an important point. And, and one of the things that uh, uh, in my book on alcohol that's really important is there's a lot of really good social science literature. Uh, that looks at in criminology, psychology, and sociology uh, that looks at some of these types of issues. For example, in particular, that looks at uh, alcohol and the use of alcohol uh, in aggression, in masculinity. And I think what uh, this question raises uh, is uh, there's information and theories uh, that we can uh, draw from at different times and recontextualize that information in our thinking about the Holocaust. And in cases, of, let's say Argentina, or if we look at if we if we look at uh, at that case, one of the things that we might not be able to do is to be able to import an idea that fits perfectly with the Holocaust uh, uh, the Holocaust paradigm that we're thinking about. But what I found in my comparative study of the Nazi East and the American West is that I found new questions for interrogating. Uh, uh, my understanding of Nazism by studying the American West that I wouldn't have come to if I hadn't made that study. Uh, and so I think that that really uh, is one of the values in looking at genocide studies more broadly and looking at these actions. For example, uh, in the book, I talk about the killing in Indonesia and uh, in a particularly horrific example, the, uh, the act of killing the film that many may be familiar with, one of the perpetrators talks about strangling uh, uh, Indonesian communists. And he talks about how the smell of blood was a terrible smell and it was really messy. And he had to create a new, a new technique for doing it. Well, if we look at, for example, uh, the killing fields uh, in the East, we see many of the perpetrators and some of those uh, who are witnesses talk about uh, this kind of sense of smell and what it's like out there. And why is that important? Well, I think it also takes us out of the ivory tower a little bit uh, and allows us to kind of be in a situation where you have to think about what does it mean to eat a sandwich at a gravesite that smells like that? What does it mean to play music 
uh, at a grave site like that. And these are the kinds of questions that some of the social science literature and some of this broader look at uh, genocide in general, I think it gives us uh, those kinds of insights. Thank you, Ed. Uh, and thanks to everybody for such a vibrating uh, and vibrant discussion with so many insights and, and different uh, We had Gabby Pinder, which you wanted to ask. We didn't we? Uh, yes, Adi, do you want to ask my questions for me? Or should I ask them? We forgot to ask uh, Gabriel's uh, questions. I had two questions. If I, Can you hear me? Please yeah. go ahead. Yes, thank you. I had one for each presenter. For Professor Weber, uh, Weber my question is, what is the difference between uh, your argument and Saul Friedland's uh, argument about uh, Hitler's redemptive anti-Semitism? I um, have trouble seeing uh, a substantial difference. Perhaps you could clarify that for me. And the other question is for Professor Himka. It's nice to see you again. And uh, my question is, uh, in the present context of uh, the Russian invasion on Ukraine, and in the hopes that uh, the current war will end soon and that Holocaust scholars will be able to resume their work, um, how might the war affect uh, Holocaust scholarship in Ukraine? And uh, not only in uh, thinking about uh, the fact that the people will be able to resume their work, but might it also um, have a uh, cause lead to a conceptual shift in the way that people think Holocaust scholars think about in Ukraine think about the Holocaust. Yeah, maybe I'll go first then. Sure, go, go for it. I'm unmuted. Um, yeah, I think that you know the, the war could could um, intensify the interest in the nationalists and the glorification of the nationalists. On the other hand, you know, it, I, my crystal ball doesn't work well. But on the other hand, you have a war here where you really don't need the kind of heroes that they used to have, the Oun and the Upa. You now have people who have been uh, fighting a pretty victorious, difficult battle. Uh, so that I'm hoping that in the new constellation, uh, that uh, especially in, in terms of the denazification of Ukraine, that they will move away from that kind of cult and glorification of the wartime nationalists and instead look elsewhere for their heroes and for their um, inspiration. Okay. Thank you. Um, as far as the question about South Friedland or, and my interpretation is concerned, I mean, the uh, I suppose there is a lot of convergence. I mean, I was not trying to kind of build, uh, build myself up as someone who's saying something is totally different from uh, South Friedlander. Uh, but um, I do, but um, there is a difference. I mean, I suppose the similarity of the convergence lies in the idea that there's something earlier, that there's something in terms of ideas, world of ideas, and that those ideas have consequences. But I suppose in Zal Friedlander's case, if, or at least if I understand Zal Friedlander correctly, this is, well, this is about redemption. This is a quasi-religious um, issue for both for him as well collectively for Germans, while the Hitler that I present is someone who is in a way really trying to 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 solve a problem. I mean, someone who is um, in the aftermath of the First World War, he's really trying to understand the underlying um, weaknesses are the primary weaknesses of Germany, both domestically as well as externally, and who, come, who through attending lectures, who re reading around a lot, uh, comes, to, comes to the conclusion that it is the supposedly pernicious influence of Jews, so not just of, um, so it's both Jewish ideas as well as Jewish bodies, that fatally weaken German society, and that in order for Germany to recover, um, and to be, become a stronger society that can also compete externally, Germany needs to 
get rid of those kinds of influences and needs to kind of purge, purge itself of, of both Jews as well as of Jewish ideas. Um, so my emphasis lies less on redemption or on quasi-religious ideas. Um, but, but again, there is, there, there, there is convergence in terms of the power of ideas. And uh, I'm certainly a great admirer of his work. Thank you. All right, it's now time to conclude. Thanks to everybody for such an engaging uh, discussion. And as the tradition wants it, uh, we pass on to Boaz Cohen, the head of uh, the Holocaust Studies program and the father of this online series. So uh, it, is, uh, it is him who will conclude this event. Okay, uh, father is too big here. Uh, nothing would have happened without Daniela and the team. And I do want to welcome Adi Cantor to our team. You heard her leading this uh, event. Uh, we are really happy to have a, a more scholars engaging in building these events, not only in uh, speaking in them. I would uh, like to start with saying that we ended our last event on the uh, a, a, less than a month ago, on the day of the breakout of the, uh, at the beginning of the uh, Russian invasion of the Ukraine. We, and we, since it was an event in, uh, about children in war, in post-war, we ended it with a prayer for children in the Ukraine. And now the war is still on. And we have a big prayer for everyone there, uh, uh, which we, uh, it is important to show our support and belief in this. I think it is uh, uh, very important to follow and to support indeed the Russian Holocaust scholars. But generally, I think uh, we have, uh, uh, as historians, uh, people, some, most people here that I know are historians, uh, we have a lot of thoughts. When we see these events, I'm not comparing to the Holocaust, but we certainly can remember the 30s uh, and the four, uh, 40s very strongly now. Uh, I would like uh, to mention two issues here. Uh, we spoke, uh, Professor Weber talked about uh, the importance of Hitler's anti-Semitism and uh, even his own personal uh, move from uh, full functionalism to uh, something else. I think, uh, I think uh, Professor Michman calls this neo-intentionalism. Uh, uh, and uh, I think this is a really important issue. I think this is also reflect something that we have thought uh, th uh, was over, and that is a, a very widespread anti-Semitism also in the Western world, and not uh, only in Eastern Europe, but uh, in the Western world. Something that people thought was over, at least uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you would have said that uh, in the US, uh, Jews would have to contend with anti-Semitism, people would not have believed you because there were two places where you had no anti-Semitism, which is Israel and the US. And now suddenly we find that anti-Semitism is uh, uh, getting stronger all over. And uh, maybe this brings us back to reread uh, the Nazis and understand uh, the importance of anti-Semitism in that uh, context that you can't do talk about Holocaust without anti-Semitism. And I think if I may say the genocide debate now in Germany uh, with genocide scholars trying to uh, like sideline the Holocaust as the Holocaust of the Jews because now they have other agendas and it also disturbs you from, you can't criticize Israel anymore because of the Holocaust. And uh, in order to effect a change, you have to de-Judaize the events of World War II and the Holocaust. And I think this is something that a, a, you, you, the work presented here and the discussion around it really brings us back uh, to the basics of the story, maybe. Uh, about the Ukraine, I would say that uh, 
indeed, I, I uh, having followed uh, some of the scholars uh, working also, I think uh, during the years I've been following Professor Himka and seeing how much fire he has drawn uh, throughout the years because of his work on the OUN. And uh, I think for many years I've been uh, looking at this, noticing this, and now we see uh, scholars uh, of some of whom you mentioned saying that they are being now attacked for not being patriotic enough because they are writing on crimes of uh, the OUN. Uh, I think this is, uh, again, uh, something that we see much in Eastern Europe, but I think uh, uh, the role of historians becomes more and more important here. I think uh, of researchers, whether people doing other research on the Holocaust, if they're not historians, but they were, of research, good research, uh, responsible research, looking at the truth, not a, a using it for, a, for propaganda purposes, a, accepting that some chapters of history are not so nice uh, in, uh, in not so nice period and not so nice to the national story. But still, that, that, uh, and knowing also that this doesn't have any relation to the war, uh, to the uh, attack on the, on the Ukraine. Like, and I think I, I've been convinced that more and more that the work historians are doing is really important and uh, we are doing. And I think uh, this discussion and this uh, issue, the debate around uh, OUN history in the Ukraine and generally a uh, history of uh, certain groups in the Ukraine today is very important. And it's also important to be put in context, which is uh, something that without historians we can't do. So thank you for our uh, really uh, uh, impressive uh, presenters. Thank you for we, uh, accepting our invitation to come and speak on this uh, platform. I think uh, this is a, a, we try to build a place for Holocaust research when we started two years ago in the breakout of the COVID. And I think we, have the, we are doing this. And uh, we hope that from this, we will uh, go on. If you looked at the chat, you can see already Daniela put the link to the next event, which is about Western Europe for a change. Uh, new research on Western, new perspective in Western Europe, and uh, maybe it's about time we look at there. Uh, so thank you for the team, to the team, thank you to the presenter, and thank you to all who came. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. See you soon. Thank you. Bye -bye.